Uh, so about four years ago, Governor Gina Raimondo announced that Invenergy, a Chicago-based corporation, was going to build a new $1 billion fracked gas and diesel oil burning power plant in the northwest corner of our state in Barville, Rhode Island. I was working then as a reporter for Rhode Island Future, a progressive news blog, and it seemed to me that building a new fossil fuel burning power plant in this era of climate change was a bad idea. Um, I thought it might be interesting to write about the process of approving such a power plant, and since Invenergy wanted an expedited hearing schedule and shovels in the ground in about six months, I figured the story would resolve itself quickly and predictably, but that didn't happen. Over the next four years, I wrote hundreds of stories about Invenergy, covering every aspect of the case, chasing the story from Barville to Johnston to Providence to Charleston, Warwick, Woonsocket, Fall River, and beyond. During that time, I would leave Rhode Island Future and strike it on my own with Uprise Rhode Island. And even today, I'm still writing about some aspects of this case. In Rhode Island, the decision to build or not build a power plant falls to the EFSB, the Energy Facility Siting Board, which is a creature of state statute. Established in 1986, the EFSB was formed to bypass community involvement in the decision-making process. With the formation of the EFSB, local municipalities could no longer prevent unwanted infrastructure from being built in their communities. With the power to overrule all local zoning and building codes, the EFSB could overrule local legislatures and the will of the people. Since 1986, no power plant application brought before the EFSB had been rejected, and no power plant application had taken more than a year or so to be approved. And the very first power plant approved by the newly formed EFSB was the Ocean State Power Plant built in Barville, Rhode Island. So over the first six months of the Invenergy hearings, a movement formed in the town to oppose the power plant. Uh, the people would speak out about how the power plant would alter their community. But this wasn't simply a NIMBY issue, not in my backyard. The people of Barville had an informed environmental perspective. They saw themselves as caretakers of the air, water, and land. The place they wanted to build this power plant was a patch of near pristine wilderness that served as a vital choke point for wildlife moving up and down the east coast of the United States, of the east coast of the United States. Um, endangered and threatened species were at risk. Later in the case, an expert speaking on behalf of the environmental group, the Nature Conservancy, called the area the best example left of this kind of habitat between Boston and Washington, D.C. The advocacy against the power plant was little noted in mainstream press. Several politicians, union members, and policy wonks familiar with Rhode Island politics told me that my focus on the Invenergy story was a waste of time. It was, they said, a done deal. But if it was a done deal, then I wanted to show the effects on the community when a large corporation ignores the will of the people. So I got to know the people of Barville, and they got to know me. The people of Barville had a hard time attracting the attention of the so-called real press, the television stations in the Providence Journal, but they had me. I would show up and video record long hearings, some lasting multiple nights and over and until near midnight. Then I would make the 40-minute trek back home to Providence, where I would spend hours processing video and pictures. I didn't miss many meetings. I recorded all the comments made by the people of Barville, and to my surprise, the people of Barville were using my videos to become better public speakers themselves. Over time, I saw people uncomfortable with public speaking becoming polished and confident. Much better public speakers, in fact, than I am. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> due to their advocacy, the people of Barville managed to delay the proceedings. When Invenergy wanted to tap the water from a tainted well, the people of Barville convinced the municipality in charge of that well to cancel their agreement. They did the same thing in Woonsocket, successfully petitioning the Woonsocket City Council to not do business with Invenergy. 
These delays and others of Invenergy's own making dragged the hearings out for four long years. During that time, as more and more renewable energy sources like solar and wind came online throughout New England, it became more and more apparent that the power plant was not needed. During that time, every single environmental group in Rhode Island and most of the legislatures of the cities and towns in Rhode Island came out against the power plant. Governor Gina Raimondo, she changed her position from support to neutrality, at least publicly, as did Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, the climate champion who supported the power plant early on. Then, this year, on a day I'll never forget, and for the first time ever, the Energy Facility Siting Board rejected a power plant application. Yeah. Invenergy had lost, the people of Barville had won, uh, the done deal wasn't done after all. So what did I learn as a journalist? Well, first I learned more about power companies and energy markets than I ever dreamed possible. Some of the stories I wrote about were so complicated they required glossaries to accompany my reporting. But more importantly, I learned that journalism needs to be people-focused, right? Too often we treat statements from large corporations like Invenergy as holding more weight than the statements of directly affected people. I learned that when we hand over important decisions to non-elected boards like the EFSB, we are bypassing democracy. Sure, the EFSB made the right decision in this place, in this case, but, two, but the EFSB had never before rejected a power plant application. When we turn over important decisions to non-elected boards like the EFSB or any, other, any number of other non-elected boards, we are bypassing democracy. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> I learned that climate change, despite being critically important, has no bearing when it comes to approving a power plant. The EFSB, when deciding to approve or not approve a power plant, decides based on three criteria. They decide based on need, they, um, whether it will be good for ratepayers, and if it will incur local environmental impacts that cannot be remediated. And that's it. It doesn't matter that the fracking incurs local non uh, environmental effects that cannot be remediated in Pennsylvania or states west of Rhode Island. The fact that burning fossil fuels is accelerating climate change does not matter. Only the three factors I listed, need, ratepayer savings, and local environmental impacts can be considered. But the most important lesson I learned as a journalist was that truth is more important than balance. Too many journalists see balance as the objective of reporting. They see they think the job is to gather the opinions of people on both sides of an issue and then cast a government agency like the EFSB as a sort of referee. All stories become, all, all stories become contests and all journalism becomes sports coverage. The truth is that new fossil fuel infrastructure is not needed, that climate change is on track to destroy the world and kill humanity, that money bends the will of politicians, and that some people will lie in the service of profit to get their opinions in the press. Just look at the Providence Journal. They, they're publishing op-eds from climate change deniers on their editorial page and full-page ads from Invenergy elsewhere. Journalism must serve the truth. Too often, corporate media serves advertisers, profit, and the money to lead. To the extent that my work help the people of Barville to defeat the $1 billion fracked gas and diesel oil burning power plant, it was because I relentlessly published the truth like a drumbeat and I called out the corporate bullshit. This is the place I think I occupy in the journalistic ecosystem of Rhode Island and it's a place I hope to occupy for many, many years to come. Thank you.